Okay, then here's a close-up of another 6th century black figure vase. The subject is Hercules, engaged in the first of his 12 labors, wrestling the Nemean lion. This face was probably both made and painted by Pasiax, one of the most well-known Greek artists of the period. Until the mid-20th century, it was not at all clear how the red and especially the black colors were achieved by such artists, but it's now known that they were produced as a result of the firing process. The clay has a high iron content, and the red color is simply Fe203, which is ferric oxide, better known as rust. It's produced when the clay is fired in a very hot, oxygen-rich kiln. The black-colored glaze is composed of ferrous oxide, FeO, and is produced when the oxygen is reduced and temperature lowered. There's more to it than this, but the bottom line is that the colors are a result of chemical changes. The vases are not painted with red and black colors, as one might suppose. Lines are then sometimes incised and filled with chalk, and occasionally some other colors are also actually painted on. This is what's called a kylix. It's the kind of thing from which the Greeks drank wine. It's like a shallow bowl with handles. And the inside of this one was painted by Exekius, often considered the Rembrandt, the, the greatest of the black-figured painters. The subject is, in fact, the wine god himself, Dionysus, who was once kidnapped by pirates whom he turned into porpoises, which now swim around him in frustration as he lolls on their boat, redecorated with a grape arbor to suit his taste. This is about as far as 6th century Greek painters go in attempting to represent anything but the human figure. You should especially notice the attempt to make the billowing sail look three-dimensional. As we'll see shortly, the Greeks, especially in sculpture and architecture, borrowed a lot from Egypt. But Greek paintings don't owe anything very obvious to Egyptian ones. Even the Minoan subjects from Knossos and the soldiers on the Mycenaean vase we saw earlier are essentially in true profile, something which the ancient Egyptians seem to have had real trouble with the whole of their artistic history. Here we can see another 6th century vase by Exekius, this time with Achilles and Ajax playing some board game Probably not anything as challenging as chess. I doubt they could have mastered chess. This is probably something more like tic-tac-toe, in fact. Any kind of thinking is a rare event in the Iliad. I'd be willing to bet that in most translations, the word think doesn't even occur. Achilles never reflects on what to do. He's never sickly to or by the pale cast of thought. It's act and react. In a few months, when we see the Italian Renaissance picture of Federigo, the famous one-eyed Duke of Urbino, reading a book in his library with full armor on, I think you may be reminded of this. Just like Federigo, these fellows are ready to leap into battle at any time. This is the suicide of Ajax now on another vase by Exekius. After the death of Achilles, the Greeks voted to give his armor to Odysseus as the one most worthy. And Ajax felt dishonored by this. And honor is the thing that matters most to the Greeks. Honor, glory, reputation, things like that. As thinking is absent from the Iliad, so is morality in the usual sense. The Greeks want to be known for bravery and loyalty, not for being good in the way we usually mean when we use the word. This is a complex issue, but I think one could argue that despite Christianity's influence, until relatively modern times, the good man was not so much the morally good man, but the man who lived up to his commitments, who was loyal to his king, to his people, or whatever. That was then to be moral, to be good in the most favored sense. To sit down and ponder whether one's king or country was morally right in some supernational subspecie eternitatis sense before agreeing to fight for it would never have occurred to most men, certainly not most men in the Iliad. The largest of all 6th century Greek vases isn't pottery at all. It's bronze and was found in the tomb of some Gallic chief at Vix near Châtillon-sur-Seine, southeast of Paris. This is 6 feet high, weighs over a quarter of a ton, and will hold 300 gallons of your favorite beverage. It's one of the largest surviving Greek bronze works of any kind. How it got all the way from Greece to the Ile-de-France would certainly make an interesting story, I think. 
Even if these vases we've been seeing are nice, when you think of Greek art, probably the first thing to come to mind is sculpture, though. It is the Greek art form par excellence. We saw the very beginning of mainland Greek sculpture at the 13th century Lion Gate of Mycenae, but throughout the Dark Ages after that, there is hardly anything in the way of carved stone for hundreds of years. And then when it does recur, sculpture, it owes nothing obvious to that Mycenaean precedent. This is the so-called dipylon head in the Athens National Archaeological Museum. It's from a funerary monument of the 7th century in the same cemetery we heard about in connection with pottery. And it's considered to be all that's left of the oldest large kouros, or statue of a, a man in Greek art. <laughs> In 1898, this pair of life-size figures was found at Delphi, where they are still in the museum, and they are the earliest surviving, essentially complete life-size kouroi, or standing male statues. Paul McKendrick says that they are identified on the base as Cleobus and Biton. They may be Cleobus and Biton, but I don't think there's any such inscription, and as you know, I don't trust McKendrick. The statues are apparently signed by their sculptor, Polymedes of Argos. The inscription is not very clear, but at least it does seem to exist. And this makes them also the earliest surviving signed works of Greek sculpture. Assuming that they are Cleobus and Biton, we know their story from Herodotus. The essence of it is that they were the twin sons of a priestess of the famous Temple of Hera near Argos, and one day, when the oxen to draw her cart weren't available, they pulled it all the way to the temple themselves. Their mother then asked the goddess to grant them the greatest blessing possible, and the next morning she found them dead in the temple. The point is that the best thing that can happen to you is to die just after you've done something really good. Otherwise, you'll probably mess your life all up. As we'll see, this was a lesson that was reinforced by the experiences of some of the greatest Greek heroes. As with the dipylon head, there's nothing here reminiscent of Mycenae or a fortiori of Knossos. The ancestors of these fellows are, in fact, very clearly Egyptian. On the left in this picture... <clears throat> is a kouros of about 75 years later, and on the right is the statue we saw earlier of Menkare in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Even though the Greeks, by the time this statue was made, the one on the left, were already treating the human body much more realistically, the origin of the figure in Egyptian art is still beyond question. The poses are identical. The hair of the Greek mimics the headdress that Pharaoh wears, and it's been reasonably suggested that the origin of the so-called archaic smile that is typical of Greek sculpture in the 6th century is also Egyptian. What's obviously not of Egyptian origin is the nudity, and nudity will be standard for freestanding male statues throughout the whole history of ancient Greek sculpture. Apropos of Cleobus and Biton, Paul McKendrick says that it looks like their hands are actually positioned as though they were carrying their mother's cart. He seems unaware of the fact that holding the hands that way is part of the whole Egyptian format, and Pharaoh didn't drag any carts around. This is the calf bearer of about 570 in the Acropolis Museum, and you can see the archaic smile more clearly now. The style of Greek sculpture in this age, more or less the 6th century BC, is in fact called archaic. When I was talking about Egyptian sculpture earlier, I mentioned in connection with the portrait of Khafre we saw that the slight smile has the effect of adding to the attitude of serene strength it conveys. In some early examples of the archaic style, the smile seems just like a way of sculpting the mouth, though. It doesn't seem meant to indicate any emotion. This is the mid-6th century Rampan Horseman, the original head of which is in the Louvre and the original body of which is in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. Since neither museum will give up its part to the other, when you go to the Louvre, you see the real head with the cast of the body, and when you go to the Acropolis Museum, you see the real body with the cast of the head. In this example, it really does look like the face is smiling, 
It's almost like the fellow's laughing even, but whether the sculptor meant for us to interpret the face this way is debatable. <laughs> This is a kore, or female statue now, and many of these have, like the calf bearer and the rampant horseman, been found on the Acropolis. After the Persians wrecked the place in 480, the Athenians buried many of the damaged statues that had been left there as votive offerings, apparently treating them as having been in effect killed or violated in some spiritual sense by the Persians, and many of these have now been recovered. It is typical of votive statues like this one to have had a hand extended in which offerings could be placed by the donor. And these hands are usually missing now since they, along with the heads, were the easiest things to break off. This quarry is one of the most well-preserved of its kind, with even a lot of the original paint surviving. And it's important to remember that the clothing, at least, of most archaic quarries was painted. Probably this was also true of the freestanding marble statues of the Classic period, but since few, if any, of the originals are thought to survive, it's hard to be sure. This is a late archaic quarry. And by the time this was made, near the end of the 6th century, the treatment of the face and figure was becoming much more naturalistic. The technical work on these statues is very impressive and is not always obvious in photographs. They often look like they were carved with very fine tools like razor blades or something. The only 6th century Greek life-size freestanding bronze statue to survive is this one, the so-called Piraeus Apollo, which was found in the harbor there in 1959. Bronze was a far more popular medium than marble among the Greeks, but it is, as I've said, all too easily recycled into things like swords and plowshares. Here's the figure up closer. Although he's called the Piraeus Apollo, he's not Apollo. He's a male votive statue with upturned palms outstretched like those of the Acropolis Chores we saw just a few minutes ago. This is the 6th century grave stele of Ariston by the sculptor Aristocles. It was found near Athens, and both names are inscribed on the base. I think that, with a handful of exceptions, the most memorable Egyptian sculpture is in relief, even if the artists never mastered, or at least never chose to use, the true profile. Nevertheless, archaic Greek reliefs don't look Egyptian at all, and they are in true profile from the very beginning of the style. This might be in part due to the fact that the Greeks never saw the best Egyptian examples which were in tombs. That's to some extent true of the paintings as well, though there were plenty of temple and pylon reliefs and paintings for them to copy if they'd been so inclined. But somehow the Egyptian relief style and painting style didn't strike the same chord with, with the Greeks that freestanding Egyptian statuary did. Here's another stele in the Athens National Museum. This was the tombstone of a fellow named Lysias, who probably died about 510, and some paint actually still survives on it. The reconstruction at the left shows what it may have once been like, but about all that can be made out now on the original is the galloping horse at the bottom. This is another grave stele of about the same date in the Bulgarian Museum of Archaeology in Sofia. About 500, the erecting of such tombstones was prohibited, apparently out of concern that they displayed something of the pride, the hubris, which was thought offensive to the gods. But most of the surviving archaic ones don't seem at all pretentious, and this one is about as modest as a tombstone could be. In fact, until the Hellenistic period, there were 
a few very pretentious funerary monuments in Greece. To a large extent, the Greeks of the Archaic period shared in the general pessimism of the Near East, apart from Egypt, of course, regarding man's post-mortem fate. The most that could be hoped for was a kind of shadowy existence in the dark, unpleasant world of Hades. Even Achilles got nothing better and said he would rather be a slave on earth than rule the dead. By the 5th century, however, the influence of Pythagoras and Plato and the mystery religions would lead many to at least hope for something better, and this arguably helped prepare the way for the eventual success of Christianity. The most impressive surviving ensemble of archaic sculpture is from the treasury of the Siphnians at Delphi. Cities erected small buildings at the famous sanctuary there to serve as repositories for civic offerings and as witnesses to their devotion to Apollo himself. And this decoration comes from one of those erected, in this case by the citizens of the island of Siphnos, which became famously but briefly rich after the discovery of gold on it. The building, which only survives in fragments, was probably the first all-marble building built on the Greek mainland. The subject of this frieze from it is the battle between the gods and the giants. According to the usual telling of the story, the giants were the offspring of the blood of Uranus, who was castrated by his son Kronos, who tried to eat all of his own children by Rhea, who managed to save one of them, Zeus, who forced him to vomit up the others. Zeus and his regurgitated siblings then overthrew Kronos and defeated the giants, the siblings of Kronos, when they tried to claim heaven themselves. In this view, the giants are the figures who look like armed men. The one in the center is being gobbled by the pet lion of Rhea, a.k.a. Sibylle or Kibele, a.k.a. the Anatolian mother goddess. It's thought that the twins, Apollo and Artemis, are chasing the giant at the right. This is a close-up of the center, it's probably safe to say that that's no longer the archaic smile on this giant's face. This phrase, also from the treasury of the Siphnians, probably depicts the episode from the Iliad in which Aeneas and Hector fought Menelaus and Ajax. This is very high relief. The lower body of the presumed Ajax at the right is carved essentially in the round. A sort of transitional style called severe is usually said to come between the archaic period of the 6th century and the beginning of the classic period in the 5th. And the Strangford Apollo here in the British Museum is usually said to be in this style, which is characterized by the loss of the smile and greater realism. The dates for this severe style are something like 500 to 450, and the Strangford Apollo would be one of the earliest in it. One of the most celebrated examples of sculpture in this style is the so-called Critios boy, named after the presumed sculptor of him in the Acropolis Museum. This is not life-size, it's only about three feet tall as it stands now with the feet missing, but it's the most lifelike statue we've seen yet in the whole history of art. One of the things that makes it look especially realistic is the way the figure stands. This is the earliest surviving example of the use of what's called contrapposto, the placing of the weight on one leg, what's called the engaged leg, the subject's left one in this case. If one has to stand still, especially for any length of time, it is natural to put the weight of the body primarily on one leg this way. We don't stand stiffly with one foot in front of the other, the way Egyptian and archaic Greek figures do. This natural pose also gives a slight S shape to the figure, a slight curve which is thought to add to its beauty and which eventually came to be included in most freestanding statues till the fall of Rome. The contrapposto and the curve will sometimes be exaggerated so much that the figures can hardly stand up by themselves. <laughs> 
Well, we've been talking about Greek art in the archaic period for a while now, essentially the 6th century. And in that same century, the Greeks are sometimes said to have, in effect, invented two very important things in the history of civilization, democratic government and philosophy. After the Dorian invasion, the monarchy in Athens was replaced by a group of archons who formed something of a republic run by an hereditary aristocracy, in effect. By the 7th century, however, the division between rich and poor had become a danger to the stability of the state, and a fellow named Draco was commissioned to, in effect, draw up a kind of constitution, the purpose of which was to allow the rich to keep as much as possible while avoiding revolution. The punishments imposed by Draco, Draco's system were so severe, so draconian, however, that the cure proved worse than the disease. Sometime after 594, Solon was then appointed to draw up a new plan, and this went much farther toward dealing with the grievances of the, the poor. This is a portrait said to be of Solon, but like probably all surviving such images of Greek heroes, it is a Roman work, though likely a copy of a Greek original, which, however, would not have been contemporary with the subject either. One of the chief causes of public trouble directly addressed by Solon's constitution was the matter of mortgage debt, and debt generally, which forced many Athenians into virtual slavery to their landlords. Their bodies became their only collateral. Solon solved this by simply canceling mortgage debt altogether, a plan that might get him some votes today, I think though he refused the demand of the radicals to actually confiscate and redistribute the property of the noble families, the Eupatridae, who also had a monopoly on participation in the government. Although he belonged to this class himself, he also abolished this monopoly and made office holding dependent on wealth rather than on birth alone. All Athenian citizens also were to be entitled to membership in an ecclesia, or assembly, which had the power, on paper at least, to approve all legislation. We don't have time here to go into more detail about his constitution, important as it was, and in any case, it was soon modified in ways which were to remain important more or less throughout the 5th century BC. In 546, Solon's own relative, Pisistratus, pulled off a coup d'etat and seized power as what the Greeks call a tyrannos, which is the root of our word tyrant, although to be a tyrannos wasn't necessarily to be what we think of as a tyrant. In the most general sense, the word tyrannos just meant ruler, but it was usually used to refer to someone who, like Pisistratus, had seized power in what was regarded as an unlawful way. It is thought by some that this equestrian statue in the Acropolis Museum may in fact represent him or possibly one of his sons. The real character of Pisistratus is hard to get at beneath the apparent legends about him that survive, but most modern historians do think his reign, in which most of the reforms of Solon were retained while ultimate power remained in his hands, was essentially beneficial and he is associated with several important developments. I mentioned earlier that he is supposed to have sponsored an authoritative edition of the works of Homer, and he also was a general patron of arts and letters. The worship of Athena and the Panathenaic festival were given official emphasis as a unifying force in the life of the city, and the predecessor of the 5th century Parthenon is thought by many to have been built in connection with this. He also developed the agora, the marketplace, and did much to encourage trade, Unfortunately, however, he attempted to leave power to his two sons, Hippias and Hipparchus, who didn't have his political skill. This is a marble copy of what was originally a bronze monument honoring two fellows named Harmodius and Aristogiton, the two Athenians known as the Tyrant Slayers. After an insult by Hipparchus to the family of Harmodius, the latter and his friend Aristogiton attempted the assassination of Hipparchus and his brother but although Hipparchus was killed, Harmodius and Aristogiton were themselves both killed as well. Hippias, originally a much more sensible fellow than Hipparchus, reacted repressively after the latter's assassination and was forced later to flee to Persia. The beneficiary of this was a powerful politician named Cleisthenes, 
Solon is more well known for his connection with the development of democracy than Cleisthenes, but Herodotus gives Cleisthenes credit for being the real founder of the democracy, and his modifications of the Constitution certainly did give it its most well-known features, the features it kept essentially throughout the 5th century. In this picture, you can see the Penix Hill from the Acropolis. As in Solon's day, all citizens by the arrangements of Cleisthenes were ipso facto members of the assembly which met there. However, not all who lived in Athens were citizens. The population was about 200,000, but well over half of that number were women and slaves, and many who were citizens lived too far away to participate regularly. The assembly met four times a month, and for some big decisions, a quorum of 6,000 was required, but typically only a few hundred would have been present at its uh, convocations. This is a view from the Penix Hill back toward the Acropolis now. The speaker's platform is to the right. The assembly's chief business was to approve or reject proposals made to it by the Council of 500, which was composed of 50 citizens from each of the 10 tribes into which Cleisthenes divided the city, and membership in which was based on place of residence rather than the traditional family connection. The delegates from each tribe to the council were chosen by lot and served for a year. This is a closer view of the speaker's platform on the Penix Hill. Anyone who wanted could speak on proposals presented by the council to the assembly here, but there were people whom we might now regard as party leaders who did most of the actual debating. The order in which citizens spoke was determined by age, which seems to me to be a better and better idea every year. Vote was by a show of hands, and a simple majority passed the proposal. This is a view from the Acropolis toward the Agora, the marketplace, or what we might regard as downtown Athens in the 5th century. At the right is the reconstructed Stoa of Attalus, originally built in the 2nd century BC. It now houses the Agora Museum. At the far left is the Temple of Hephaestus, sometimes called the Temple of Theseus, which was built at about the same time as the Parthenon, and we'll hear more about these buildings eventually. The presiding tribe of the council met in a building called the Bulutarion on the west side of the Agora, in the neighborhood there of the, the Hephaestion, the Temple of Hephaestus. The Athenian year was divided into ten 30-day months, and each of the ten tribes took charge of state business for one month. Each day of that month, a new leader was chosen by lot from the presiding tribe's 50 delegates, and he became something like a king for a day. As an ordinary guy, your chances of serving as de facto head of state at least once in your lifetime were very good. In this picture, you can see the foundations of the Tholos, the round building, which was the, the most interesting part architecturally of the Bulutarion complex. It apparently served as at least a dining room and probably had other functions as well that archaeologists still argue about. It's important to notice that the Athenian democracy was not like ours altogether. The citizens did not, with few exceptions, elect members of the government to represent them. They represented themselves. It's usually said that this sort of Athenian direct democracy would be wholly unworkable in a large modern state the size of the United States, but especially in California, the use of ballot propositions as returned an element of directness to our democracy that might surprise the founding fathers. It's often argued that direct participation in the government by the citizens of Athens helped fuel the freedom of thought we associate with the age of Socrates and Plato and the civic pride which built the Parthenon, but this is certainly an oversimplification. The organizers of the exhibit of Greek art which came to the U.S. a few years ago tried to argue for a connection between Greek democracy and classical art, but I think Robert Hughes was right when he said that one might as well argue that there was a connection between abstract expressionism and the election of Harry Truman. We'll eventually hear a bit more about the workings of Athenian democracy, but this is now a map of the coast of Asia Minor.
Turkey, of course, today. And it was along this coast that, as we've heard, most of the early important Greek writers lived. And this is also the part of the world where we could say Greek philosophy was born. It's maybe a little unfair to emphasize the way the Greeks thought about things and approached problems over against, say, the way the Egyptians, Hebrews, and Babylonians did, but at the same time, there is no doubt that the kind of systematic reasoning that's characteristic of the Greeks, culminating in Aristotle, does seem almost completely foreign to at least the written work, the written literature of their predecessors. The place usually regarded as the headquarters of early Greek philosophy, more or less the Greek philosophy of the 6th century, give or take a few decades, was Miletus, and the man generally regarded as the first philosopher, Thales, was born there about 640. Nothing he wrote survives, but he was credited in antiquity with all sorts of accomplishments, including the prediction of a famous eclipse in 585. He's often considered the father of geometry and logic, and he is the first monist, the first fellow to argue that the world, despite its apparent multiplicity, is actually one substance which takes various shapes and forms. The substance he chose as this basic material was water, which seems a little disappointing maybe, but we don't really know how he defended this claim. He may have been led to the idea by the presence in nature of water in the form of a solid, a liquid, and a gas, all apparently very different, yet made of the same stuff. This is a model of the ancient city of Miletus in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, where the 2nd century AD main gate at the back in this picture has been reassembled. An Aximander, who was also a resident of Miletus and a pupil of Thales, argued that the basic stuff of the universe was what he called the infinite, which I guess does have a more metaphysical ring to it as a primal substance than water. He's also famous for being the first to suggest a theory of evolution in which mankind is ultimately descended from sea life and for his astronomical investigations. This is the reconstructed main gate into the city as it looks today in Berlin. But it wasn't originally erected at Miletus until some 600 years after the time of the Milesian school of philosophy. A third member of this school, Anaximenes, called the basic substance of the universe by the Greek word air, usually transliterated A-E-R, and this of course is the origin of our word air, spelled A-I-R. This is the way Miletus looks today. It's at the mouth of the Meander River, which is now meandered all through it. So, except in the hottest part of the summer, most of the ruins are in a swamp. There were several other important philosophers who also lived on the coast, if not in Miletus. Democritus lived in the 5th century in Abdera, at the north end of the Aegean. He's most famous for developing the view that the whole universe consists of tiny indivisible particles, and he used the word atomon, which is Greek for indivisible, to designate them. And this is, of course, the origin of our use of the term atom. Heraclitus of Ephesus, to the north of Miletus on the coast, held another view that sounds familiar. He argued that the universe is actually entirely energy. Heat anything enough, he noticed, and it returns to this form. All matter is actually energy. E equals mc squared. He also argued that change is constant. Everything is in a constant state of flux, fast or slow, changing into at least the appearance of something else, despite the fact that this can all be explained as just a rearrangement of the same atoms. Parmenides and his disciple Zeno lived in the Greek settlement of Elia on the south coast of Italy, and they argued that far from things changing all the time, in fact, nothing ever changes at all. That is, being itself, the universe, doesn't change. Zeno is especially famous for his paradoxes meant to support the no change, no movement view. An arrow can never reach its target, he argued, because first it has to go through half the distance to it, and before that, half of that distance, and before that, half of that distance, and so on to infinity. Exactly what to say about this, how space that is infinitely divisible can be traversed nevertheless, is something that still challenges mathematicians and cosmologists. 
There were a lot of arguments between followers of Heraclitus and Parmenides, but they are not far from actually holding the same view. What changes is not the stuff of the universe, but how it appears to us. Empedocles, who lived at Agrigento in Sicily, broke from the monists and argued that there are in fact four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, which make up the universe, and this view, which appealed more to common sense than monism maybe, was to become a standard metaphysical postulate of the Middle Ages. He also believed in the transmigration of souls into, among other things, animals, for which reason he was a vegetarian, and in this he had something in common with Pythagoras, whose name is known primarily because of the Pythagorean theorem which is attributed to him. Whether he was really the one who discovered this theorem or not, he and his pupils did make all sorts of breakthroughs. They essentially invented the concept of the square of a number and the division of numbers into odd and even, and they discovered the mathematical relationship between the length of a string and its pitch. Pythagoras was, in fact, a kind of monist, since he suggested that the basis of the universe was, in effect, numbers, mathematics. All things and the relationships among them could be explained in terms of numbers and mathematical laws. And like the theories of several of his predecessors and contemporaries, this also has a distinctly modern sound to it. His vegetarianism and belief in reincarnation were part of a general spiritual outlook, which seems to owe a lot to Eastern influence. Legend even said Pythagoras had been to India. A lot of this will also get into Plato, and arguably into Christianity as well, as we'll see. Several interesting similarities between Pythagoras and Christ himself have in fact been noticed, but we don't have time to go into that now. Okay, that's where this lecture will end, and next time we'll hear about the friction between the Greeks living along the coast of Asia Minor and the Persians who governed the area which led to big trouble for Athens, and we'll see the Parthenon.